Good afternoon. Um, I'm City Councilor Mary Ann LaBarge and I'm the Vice Chair of City Services. Um, our ch um, Chair of our City Services was unable to be here this evening, but I also would like to introduce the Councilors on City Services. To my right is our Council Vice President and Councilor at Large, Ryan O'Donnell, and we also have Councillor Dennis Bidwell from Ward 2. I'd like to call the meeting to order and roll call, please. Uh, Councillor Bidwell? Here. Councillor Carney is out. Councillor LaBarge? Present. Councillor O'Donnell? Here. And I also would like to mention that this meeting is being videoed. Today I would like to welcome um, Adam Nob. Is it Nobbit? Um, Pretty close, Novit. Novit, who is the director of Lilly Library, and you're going to be doing a presentation, and apparently some questions have been sent to you. Okay, um, so I just, my presentation is basically answering the questions that were sent to me. Um, so the first um, question that was sent to me, it says explain the mission um, and up to date on full library service. So, uh, the mission statement of Lilly Library is um, Lilly Library is dedicated to providing the best possible support for the cultural and intellectual lives of the residents, primarily but not exclusively, of the villages of Florence and Leeds. Our goal is to ensure that um, all members of our community have free access to high-quality printed materials, media, and electronic resources, and that programs will um, meet their informational and recreational needs. To achieve this goal, we are committed to maintaining a welcoming library space um, and knowledgeable and helpful staff. So, um, the Lilly Library uh, is continuing to do these things. Um, we have a very active children's program. Um, we have the summer reading program. Uh, we've added some <coughs> interest groups like a knitting club. Um, and we're also trying as an initiative to provide better services for people that are working in the gig economy or people that are working from home. So um, as of actually today, we've increased our internet speed that's available at the library by, uh, it's actually 10 times faster than it was um, the week before. We did this at very nominal costs, some of it by replacing hardware that was 10 or more years old. Um, and we've made uh, a public fax machine available and we also have wireless printing for those people that need it. So we're finding that more people are coming to the library to do work that are working out of their homes, um, and we're, we're working to support that. Uh, and another thing that is an initiative that we started is we're beginning to share some of our collections with Forbes and vice versa. So for example, it's difficult for Lilly Library to purchase enough large print books, um, for example, to make the collection interesting. Um, so what we've started to do is go over to Forbes and check out a bunch of their books and put them on our shelves to make them available to people that want to come to Lilly. Um, and a big, part of the, a big part of the collection being valuable for patrons is simply having new books on the shelf. So we found a way to leverage our relationship with Forbes Library to add value um, for the people of Florence or just the people that choose to use Lilly Library for whatever reason. Um, we also are doing that with, uh, with audiobooks, which are expensive to purchase. And so we're kind of rotating Forbes' collection into our collection so that they become available to our people. And very recently, we started purchasing um, access to database. So there's a language learning database called Mango. There's test preparation databases that have test prep for stuff like the SAT, the GMAT, certifications for plumbers, nurses, um, home health care people. And uh, a big one is Ancestry.com for people that are interested in genealogy. So we're working with Forbes to increase the access to these resources. Um, and so far, you know, that, that project is going well. It's, I stress that it's costing very little additional money, but we're able to bring things into Florence um, that we wouldn't have otherwise been able to do. 
So um, the second question that they ask is, how are programs made possible? And explain the support um, that makes this happen. For example, reading programs, public computers, and adult programs. Um, the basic library budget that's provided by the town is about $309,000. And the total budget for the library is a little bit less than 350. So that leaves uh, kind of around um, $40,000 that's made up by the library. And this either comes in um, through fees and fines, uh, fees for services like library cards or printing. Um, it's also fundraised by the Friends. It comes in from state aid. Uh, and it comes in from um, gifts to the library. That's a relatively, so like recently, we had the Hannah Hop gives gift. Um, so basically, that's how, um, that's where the financial support comes from. As far as the public access computers, uh, we were really due for a refresh in that department, and we've created a relationship with Amherst College, where Amherst College provides us with their computers as they age out. Um, so it's really, the computers that Amherst College is giving to us are, I don't know, four or five years old, but for the level of, um, for the level of use that they see as public access computers, most people are using the internet or Word documents or things like that, they're adequate. So we've created a system where we're not replacing you know, 10 computers every few years, which has made the program much easier to manage from a, a financial standpoint. Um, do you have any questions on those first two questions that I was, sure. Um, I, how did you develop the, this program with Amherst College? Was it a program they offered or? Um, yeah, it is, uh, I was the, I'd been, before I was director at Lilly, I was um, director at the Pelham Library, and I was director at the Sunderland Library. Um, and when I was director, I believe at Sunderland, we had a lot of our patrons would work at Amherst College or be involved in it um, some way. So I heard about the program from patrons, and I followed up on it, and uh, I got in touch with the right people. The program really is not, um, it's not publicized. Mm -hmm. uh, it's kind of a word of mouth thing, but I've taken it with me from library to library. Um, and, you know, it's been really great. One of the really nice things that I can say about that program is that uh, I, that re replacing computers is expensive. And what would wind up happening if we were not involved in this program is we would replace a few computers at a time. And then if we did that, we would wind up with slight variations in hardware on all the different computers. So it would be much more difficult for us to maintain all of the computers because there would be slight differences. This way we just bring all the computers in, we set up, um, we set up a flash drive, and then we clone all of the computers. So all the computers are identical. And because the computers are free, we're able to have backup computers that we just keep um, in storage. And then when a computer goes down, instead of trying to actually repair that computer in real time while patrons are waiting for it, we just hot swap it out with another computer. It goes right in. Um, we have the expertise in-house to, uh, to make that happen really in a matter of minutes. Right. So um, I, I am really trying to, as far as the financial side of the library goes, and, and really all the sides of the library, I'm trying to take advantage of the community around us um, like our relationship with Forbes, our relationship with Amherst College, um, in order to create a better economic playing field for us. I'll, I'll say also that um, I just found out that uh, I'm a, this fall I became a professor of public library management at the Simmons program. So hopefully we're gonna try and set up a work study program with Simmons mm -hmm. so that we can have library students come in um, and do work study work and provide a very, very high level of service uh, because they're in a library program they're gonna to want to achieve things. Um, so I just actually got clearance from uh, Simmons this morning in order to roll that program out. So that's great. I'm excited about that's that great. as well. Um, so you can feel free to stop me at any point. Um, so it says, 
uh, this is question number three that I was asked to answer, is please explain the changes required to paid sick leave requirements and raises for staff. Um, what is the increase of 4.33%? So where we arrived at the 4.33% budget increase uh, is kind of a combination of things. The basic, the most basic um, formula involved here is what's called the MAR, which is the municipal allocation requirement. Um, and that is a formula that's put forward by the Mass Board of Library uh, Commissioners in order to qualify us for state aid. So that's an average of the last three years. Um, and then there's a factor that they apply it to. But the city um, indicated that they were able to provide a 2.75% um, increase uh, within the budget total. So the reason for the 4.33% increase is that um, back in around 2009 or 10, they cut four hours of library service due to budget concerns within the city of Northampton. So we asked if we could restore two of those hours. And we feel that in order to run the library because it's on two floors, you need a minimum staffing of three people. So if you multiplied it all out, it came out to a little bit under $5,000. So it's, we figured it at $15 per person, three people to staff it at minimum. Um, and three people is even very thin staffing on two floors. So, um, so really, I look at that 4.33% as a restoration of services from when they were cut back. So we added back two hours this year, and it's a test case to see if people come in and use the library during those hours. The hours that we added back are from three to five on Mondays. Um, it's a pretty busy time for the library because it's sort of, uh, for a lot of people, that's after school hours. So people are picking up their kids, driving them home, they stop by the library, get the stuff that they need. And honestly, it's, uh, I think that people, it's, we certainly didn't need to advertise it. It's like we opened the doors and people just came in. Um, so next year, we'd maybe like to see the restoration of the two hours on Friday. Um, but we can talk about that, you know. So as far as the uh, paid sick leave goes, um, we have a, uh, we had a policy in place for part-time staff that they got one week of prorated sick leave um, per year. So this meant effectively for every 52 hours worked that they got one hour of sick time. The new law states that for every 30 hours worked, you get one hour of sick time. So there is some increase of liability to the library, um, but it's smaller than it would be had we never offered sick time to the staff at all. So I don't see that as a, um, and that's a very major concern for us. Um, you know, I think for us, one thing that we're looking at now is that if you, if you work for the library, um, the maximum amount of pay, I mean, the maximum amount of pay vacation you can ever have as support staff caps out at two weeks. So it doesn't matter. Um, we have one employee that has been there a little bit on and off, but since 1987. Um, so she has the equivalent of two weeks prorated uh, vacation time. And it's really, that's very different than um, other city departments uh, within Northampton. So there's at least consideration by the trustees and myself um, and some of the staff about possibly changing that. And I've looked at different spreadsheets to try and figure out um, how big of a deal that would be for us. And it's not, uh, depending on how we phased it in, I think it could be done in a way um, that would be fiscally responsible. Um, and for, as another example, we also have no bereavement pay. So um, if myself or one of the staff were to lose an immediate family member, there's no actual policy for, for bereavement. So I think that 
for me, it's the, you know, staffing is a, most of your budget. Um, those are probably the issues that are gonna be most needed to be addressed in the, in the near term. Um, another thing is that Lilly Library does not offer any kind of a step raise system. So it's, we're basically straight cost of living. No, not basically, we are just straight cost of living. So for example, this year, um, the staff received uh, what was the federal COLA as an adjustment. So it's not, I'm right, it's, you know, it's really it's tied to the rate of inflation. So does that answer people's questions? Sure. Yeah, I'm just, I'm, I'm just curious uh, why your personnel policies with regard to various leaves, Burry Family, for example, doesn't conform with, with the city's personnel policies? Um, you know, I think this is generally true of uh, a lot of libraries is that the library's renovation was happened about 10 years ago. Um, and before that, it was a much smaller library. Um, and then even before that, uh, the, the library was really only on the second floor of the building. There was a school downstairs. So I think that a lot of these policies come into being, um, and until somebody looks at them and addresses them, um, they more or less stay the way they are. So the library has grown, um, and I think that the way that we've dealt with our personnel policies has lagged, um, lagged our growth. Mm. So when we were a smaller, um, less professional library, I think the, uh, the people were working there very part time. It was just a different, it was a different place. So, you know, maybe the time has come to address these things. I certainly hope it has. So you 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 run through the city payroll system. We do not. You, you do not. We do not. No, Lily is um, Lily like Forbes, is a uh, an entity that receives funding from the city, and but we're we're our own five hundred one c three. Right. But I I I, I thought you used the city's payroll system. But I no. Stand correct. No. Okay. It is um yeah we do our own payroll in QuickBooks. We don't even have an outside company do it. So. Uh, it's okay. Okay. I would like to see us be in more line of the city, but sure. Well, that's why, for example, you have to follow the new earned sick time law, which we've had a debate about whether the whole city should adopt the earned sick time law for all those departments, but we haven't yet because we have a policy that we think is equivalent or better. But you're a private right. entity essentially, so you have to do that, mm -hmm. even though you get vast majority of your funding from the city. I mean, yes. It's a bad thing more one way or the other, but it's just, that it's, just seems interesting to me. Um, yeah, I feel like a lot of the staff has been there for a really, a very, very long time. Um, and they've shown great loyalty and they've, you know, they've brought a lot to the table. Um, they're really an extremely professional organization. Uh, so, you know, I, I hope that we can do right by them. So the next question is, um, how many people would you say use the library on a daily basis? And so uh, we had 72,125 visitors reported um, on the last, the last time we reported to the state on the ARIS report. So this works out to um, 1387 per week and 231 per day. So um, on average that's how many visitors we have. And it's it's shown a steady, stable increase over the years. So people are coming in and using the library. Um, one of the things I'll say is that, that we have many, many uh, community groups that use the, the building. So our, um, our community room is used on pretty much a daily basis by outside organizations. So there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of people benefiting from the library in many different ways. So, and uh, any questions about daily attendance? Do you charge for the use of the community room? 
we charge certain kinds of groups. So um, we don't charge people that are nonprofits or, um, you know, if somebody wanted to, uh, sometimes you get things like people want to, um, we've had, for example, somebody's parents die and they come back to town to, to settle the estate and they want to use the room. So they're not a nonprofit, but they're local people and they want to use the room, we wouldn't charge them. Um, there is a group that comes in and they have a, it's like a Spanish language learning uh, activity for little kids. Um, and they're a for-profit organization. Um, they're very much in line with, you know, the type of program that the library would like to see. Um, so we do charge them a little bit, but it's a relatively nominal fee. Uh, so I think we do charge, but it's not, you know, I don't, I don't think it's exactly market rate. But that's also something that we are looking at. We really need to see, um, because right now, I think that the situation's good. We're happy with everybody that's in there, but we really do need to make sure that, um, that, that the library is used appropriately. And this might require changes to how much we charge people that are for profit from the outside. So that's under review. Um, so the next question I was asked to answer is, are all the vacancies filled? Um, Yes, right now. Um, the, the, the staff that is the main sort of long-term staff at the library has been very stable and um, extremely um, reliable. But the library is open on both Saturdays and Sundays year-round. So Forbes, for example, is not open on weekends at all in the summertime, and they're never open on Sundays. So Sunday staffing is a Saturday and Sunday staffing are a difficult ongoing problem for the library, in part because some of the staff that works on the weekend only ever works on the weekend, so they don't work during the week. Um, so you might have somebody that would work between four and 10 hours per weekend, um, and the positions are relatively low paying, they're sort of on the $12, uh, $10, $12 range, um, and it's, it's, I've hired, a, I've been at the library for a year, and I think I've hired six people for different weekend positions. So that is a constant, uh, that is a constant turnover. And um, I'm not exactly, you know, I've only been there for a year. Um, it takes time to really understand the problem. Um, and uh, so that's something that we're gonna have to address. I think that the weekend service that the library offers is really important. We are very, very busy on Sundays. Um, it's probably our busiest day per week on a, you know, on a patrons per hour. Um, and you know, we're starting to see more stuff. Like uh, just today, I helped um, I helped somebody get uh, hunting and fishing licenses off the internet. Um, so we're starting to see that more and more things have to be done on the internet for people. And for people that either don't have access to the internet or don't have the acumen or don't have, uh, for a lot of people, they have access to the internet but they can't print things. So our weekend business is becoming more and more people that work that come into the library to really try and get things done that's required of them. Um, they may need you know, R&V forms. Um, we had a, a gentleman that was trying to get uh, papers about his uh, earnings so that he could apply for a loan. Um, and this is sort of more and more the traffic that we're starting to see. So we really need to keep those hours. We need to stay open, but it's extremely difficult to staff. So while the question is, are all vacancies filled? Yes, like all the major positions are filled. Um, but weekend staffing is a difficult thing. And I don't know whether we're going to have to pay more hour, pay more for the weekend spots, or whether we're going to have to require our regular staff to change their schedules. But it's difficult because so many of the staff that we have are part time, um, and very often part time employees have other jobs. So it becomes a matrix of getting everybody to fill in 
for those spots. So uh, are all the vacancies filled right now? Yes, um, but really that's, that's my primary concern. Adam, um, in question, when you talk about weekend hours, are you talking about Saturday and Sunday only? Yeah, Saturday and Sunday. And what are the hours? Um, we're open one to five on Sunday and we're open 10 to five on Saturday. Okay. Um, the next question is, uh, is there a parking problem for residents that come to the library? So um, I would say, generally speaking, the answer to that question is no. Um, there's a parking lot in front of the library that has maybe 16 spaces, and then people park on the street, and then people also park on the um, park in the Civic Center parking lot. So. The problem arises when there's an event at the Civic Center and at the library, or sometimes just an event at the Civic Center. Um, when, they, when there was construction at the intersection um, and it was voting day, um, that created an incredibly unique situation where there was quite a big problem trying to park at the library. But uh, in general, you know, we have a very cooperative relationship with um, the Civic Center. Uh, and you know we do our best to get along. Uh, I think that the one concern that I do have about parking is that for patrons that might have um, a disability or uh, some problem with uh, mobility, that there's just the one space that's close, that there's the one uh, handicap space, and then because the lot is so narrow, um, it's not like there's a lot of parking for people with disabilities close to the library. And when you're dealing in part with um, you know, older patron base, we tend to have a lot of people that are senior citizens, that it can be, uh, it can be difficult for those patrons. But I think for most people, um, if the lot's well, they park on the street or they park in the Civic Center parking lot. That disability spot, where exactly is that located? That's um, it's the this, only one that you're saying that is in place right now, correct? Right. So yeah. Where it's, is it's, that? it's the closest spot to the door. You looking for a second one? Um, it's it's difficult because I wish uh, I wish that we could I wish that we could have a spot where it was a disability spot. Um, but if every other spot in the lot was filled that somebody could park in it, but you can't really have that. It'd be nice if there could be some flexibility around it, mm -hmm. but there has been discussion uh, within the staff at any rate about adding a second disability spot. Um, but the, the answer is right now, I don't, I don't really have a, a solid answer either way. Uh, I do have concerns about it, but I haven't really thought it through 100% of the way to say okay. I've had some residents who do have concerns about it and would like to see another sign there. Yeah, I think um, I think it's worth a, a harder look at it to see because there's where the disability spot is now. There's a little bit of an empty space to one side of it, mm -hmm. so I think that it would mean restriping that entire side of the lot. Um, and I think <coughs> you know it's definitely a concern for us. Um, so I think it. We're, we're at the stage now where it's been brought up, it's been discussed within the organization, and we, need, we know that there needs to be um, a bit more of a serious discussion about how we can make it happen. Because just that Forbes itself, they have more than one handicapped accessible parking spot. Yeah, it's, I believe that the way that handicapped spots are uh, mandated at any rate, is that it's a percentage of the available parking. So, um, you know, when they striked the lot, I think they went with what was mandated. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but the library itself um, often serves people with disabilities, I think sometimes more than other organizations. So it definitely is a, um, it is definitely an area of special concern. Uh, also because one of our staff members uses that spot. So, especially in that situation, I think that, um, but you know, I can't say that we've made any 
decision about it at this point, but it certainly is an area of concern for us. Thank you. Okay, next question. Sure. Do you know um, the average or what the bell curve is for the amount of time someone spends at the library? Are there people who run in for like half an hour? So um, or there, I'm sure I would, there are, and then there are people who must be there for longer periods. There's, we have, uh, we have a surprising number of people, to me at any rate, who come in to, for internet access. Uh -huh. And those patrons, I would say, tend to be there for you know, a couple of hours. Mm -hmm. um, and they're a significant percentage of the visitors. And then there would be um, another like, large group of people, would be people that come in with their children to select children's books. Mm -hmm. And due to the nature of the visit and the nature of children, that um, they're in there for you know, half hour, 45 minutes, maybe an hour. Um, and then there's the sort of grab and go shoppers that come in, they have their favorite authors, they check to see if their favorite authors are there and they're like in, in and out, you know, 15 minutes. Um, so, and then there's a significant number of people in the library that are doing work on laptops just due to the nature of the area. There's a lot of academics around here. Um, so you see a lot of graduate students in the library. And uh, so, I don't know, it's, if I were to, I can't really guess on an average time, but I would say there's a group of people that tends to be there for more than two hours. Mm -hmm. Those are people that are using a computer in one way or another. Mm -hmm. And then there's a group of people that would be there for kind of up to an hour. Those are people that are coming in with children or coming in for a program or something like that. And then there's a fairly constant stream of people that are just coming in to you know, grab a video or uh, a book by their favorite author and they're just kind of in and out. So, yeah, I, I guess I, had, I don't know if you think there were half hour spaces or something. Yeah. You would just, and they may not be right. enforced strictly, but if it just sort of set a Yeah, I, for. that's maybe not a bad idea. We have, um, I was on the parking committee, which was a subcommittee of the right, transportation that's right. committee, yeah, right? Yeah. Of course. So I, I, <laughs> I tend to think about parking a lot as a, as a result of that experience. Well, just as something to think about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, I, I think, you know, maybe that's a, maybe that's a way to, yeah, ameliorate some of the, yeah. Um, so, uh, are there any renovations being looked at? This was question number seven that I was asked to answer. Um, there is a little bit of, uh, if you're standing in the Lily Library parking lot and you're facing the building, up near the peak of the roof, um, there's a woodwork area that has paint on it, and that's going to need to be repainted. And just looking at it from the ground, it looks like there's some fingering of the wood at the end of the boards. So there will have to be some amount of renovation there. I don't think it's a particularly big ticket item, but it is something that we're looking at doing. The other thing that, um, that is, uh, there's two other things actually. One of the other things is that we're looking at um, adding some more, for lack of a better word, like sort of comfortable seating to the library because right now we're primarily tables and chairs. So rather ironically, if somebody were to come in and sort of wanted to read in a comfortable chair, uh, they would have a difficult time finding one because there isn't one. So um, the furniture expenditure, because of the sort of the nature of institutional furniture and all of the fire safety compliance that goes with it, that tends to be a pretty, um, a fairly expensive process. So uh, that's something that we're looking at doing. It will certainly be thousands of dollars. Um, and right now we're sort of talking about doing it in phases, um, bringing that in. And another thing um, that uh, I'm actually having um, Antonio come in from the IT department. Um, and I don't really believe that any of the IT equipment um, has been changed since the library renovation. So I think all of that stuff in there is at least 10 years old. Um, and so there's servers and uh, switches and firewalls in there. So I actually found um, I found a, a piece of equipment in there that wouldn't process uh, information at, at, at a speed faster than 10 megabytes per second, which is maybe a speed that was acceptable in you know 2004. But um, we really need 100 megabyte equipment in there. So it was basically 
it was capping all of the public computers had to share 10 megabytes per second, which meant speeds of around one megabyte per second if you had five people on there. So um, I really don't know what is going to need to be changed at this point, but Antonio's coming in uh, next Thursday. And then we're also having a free walkthrough with a company called Entree Computers. But I expect that there will be some updating of uh, that equipment in general. Thank so, you. yep. So the next question that says, uh, could you explain about the library assistant three and the library assistant two positions? So basically, um, this is something that my predecessor did, and it's more or less a seniority ranking of the staff. So it's a, it's a, so Kim, the children's librarian, who is a, a benefited um, employee, she's a librarian one. And then the sort of the middle staff that has some seniority or has some supervisor capacity, those people are generally library two. And then um, the people that sort of just come in and work circulation on an occasional basis are library three. Uh, I looked at this, and we actually have started um, a review process to kind of get a better handle on what it is that people are actually doing. In a small organization like Lilly, people tend to pretty much do everything. So um, there are some kind of specialist functions like cataloging or interlibrary loan. But when we really look around, we find that a lot of staff are doing these functions. Um, so we're going back and we're looking at that. We're trying to come up with more descriptive terms so that it's less opaque, like librarian one. What does that mean to somebody on the outside? We're trying to look to create transparency. The other thing that we're trying to do is we do state reporting to um, the Mass Board of Library Commissioners. And I want our positions at the library to look more like the positions that we report to the state. So um, I've done this in a number of areas. We sort of have restructured our QuickBooks chart of accounts um, to more closely match what is considered both generally accepted accounting principles and um, and so that the library easily produces numbers that we can report to the Mass Board Library Commission. So there's a general push on many fronts um, to make our make Lily look more like other libraries in the rest of the state. So I think that that answers people's questions. Thank you. Sure. Um, on maintenance and improvements, um, what what gets handled yourself? What uh, gets handled through the city's central services? That's a good question. Um, so recently, um, like our telephone system is all handled by the IT department. Um, for years, uh, AC Elevator did the routine maintenance on our elevator. Um, so I wanted to see, uh, so I recently, I, next year, after our contract ends this year, we will be on um, the same contract. We'll receive the same rate as the city um, because we're going to go with the city. They, they offer to extend us the same, the same rate. Um, we're also looking at having our, our, moving our HVAC repair from our current supplier to the city's supplier. Um, again, probably not on the city's contract, but at the same rate. Um, uh, we have used the uh, we have used the city's electrician uh, for certain jobs within the library, um, and I think that the general trend, where possible, is to work more closely um, with central services, uh, if only for in some. You know, for some things, I'm not sure if they can do everything, but we're trying to at least align our procurement better. So for contracted services to go with the city, um, one thing that I'm really trying to do is uh, the probably for me, the system that has given me the most trouble within the library has been the alarm system. Um, and when, we, when you have trouble with the alarm system, it is a lot of trouble for many, many people. Um, so, for example, 
the rest of the city uses a radio transmission system that connects the buildings with uh, the dispatch. So it would be a cost to us of um, probably around $2,000, but um, I feel like the, the better reliability and the fact that uh, people at dispatch understand our system better um, makes it easier for everybody. So in general, we're trying, we're, you know, been there for a year, we're moving the elevator contract. Um, for, they also do, um, the city also does, uh, um, we're on their contract for trash removal. Or again, it's not, no, we are on the city's contract for, for trash removal. But in general, uh, I'm trying to move us closer to central services. So I've had talks with David and that's been, those have been productive. And snow removal? Snow removal is done by Spring Valley Landscaping. So um, as much as we would love to have the DPW remove uh, snow for us, I don't think that, um, I don't think that can happen for, because we're effectively private property. I want to thank you, Adam, for answering my eight questions that I sent okay. to you. And um, it opened my eyes because some of the stuff I really did not know. Right. Yeah, I mean, I'm happy. I didn't, um, this is obviously my first time through the situation. I didn't realize that people would normally gave presentations. I apologize for not having an infographic. Um, but I hope to bring an infographic next year when I'm invited back. Okay? Thank you, thank you so thank you. much. All right, sure. Yeah, happy to, happy to come. Thank you very much. Okay, we have no public comment, but I also want to apologize. Um, I had forgotten to mention our administrative assistant to a city council is Pamela Powers, who takes all of our minutes for us, and thank you, Pam. Okay, next on the agenda is the minutes of August 29th. We have a motion to approve. So moved. Second. Aye. Okay. Now, as of September 1st, our city services, we have seven applicants that we refer to our committee. So we have Conservation Commission, Lisa Busco, 130 Cross Path Road, Northampton, and the term is September 2016. And there is a, an important letter that was sent from Kevin Lake to us counselors from Maureen Carney. And I've asked Pam if she would read that. So yeah. Thank you. And this is uh, to Councilor Carney from Kevin Lake. And he indicates in your role as chair of the Committee on City Services, he understands that we are reviewing Lisa Fusco's appointment to the Conservation Commission as chair of the CONSCOM. Uh, Mr. Lake wants to express his support for that appointment. Lisa served on cons, cons com for several years and only left when her work life was such that she could not dedicate the time needed to do justice to the role. She was a valuable contributor and a voice that Mr. Lake counted on to think carefully and independently about the cases before cons com. Uh, he looks forward to her return and hopes that the committee will rule favorably on her appointment. I would just like to bring up way back, I remember through appointments and evaluations, we had interviewed Lisa Plusko, and she was highly recommended and approved by city council. And we never had any kind of concerns from the chair of the commission on Lisa. So. I just wanted to bring that forth. And Ryan, I, I think you had the responsibility of interviewing her. It's, it's probably true. I did not uh, speak to Ms. Fusco. Mm -hmm. uh, I did speak to the mayor and um, appreciated getting this email from uh, Mr. Lake, whose opinion I uh, respect generally. And of course, his personal experience on the Conservation Commission carries a lot of weight with me. Um, I mean, I, I see no reason to not approve it. I mean, I would probably feel more most comfortable with making a neutral recommendation in the case of the appointment. So I would make that motion. I second that. And if I could just inquire as to uh, why you're inclined to a neutral recommendation as opposed to 
I guess, well, I mean, under the charter, we, you know, appointments have to come here, and we have to give it some consideration. Um, and I think that's what we've done. I mean, Ms. Fusco was on the Conservation Commission previously and resigned. I know she had some, it's so tricky because you don't want to get into it that much, but I, I know she had um, perhaps personal business reasons, some other things why she resigned. I don't really know about, and I didn't, frankly, speak to her in person. And I don't know that I would have wanted to get into those things. So, um, like I say, the, the recommendation from Mr. Lake is a strong recommendation, in my opinion. Um, if someone wishes to make a positive recommendation, I would withdraw mine, but... Um, I would like to make a positive re uh, recommendation on Lisa Fusco. Like I said, we had interviewed her way back never received any kind of concerns from the chair of the commission because we used to call and ask when we were going to go ahead and review people again and we never heard anything from the chair so whatever occurred I don't want to get involved in that if it had anything to do with the outside but as a applicant I know she what Kenneth what um, Dennis Lake is saying is absolutely true about her. I think she took that position very serious. I, I would, I guess I would be inclined to support a positive recommendation as well for no other reason, basically, than I uh, very highly regard the Cons County Chair's opinion and, and inclined to be fairly deferential to the opinion of the, of the, of the, of the, of the committee, commission chair. So. Right, and you, Kevin is very, very good about recommendations, and I have a lot of trust in Kevin Lake. I, I agree with that, and I think um, it's a matter of experience. Ms. Fusco has clear experience with the environmental, lead environmental police. Um, so I think she was environmental police for quite a while. So, so, so did you want to take a vote on that? Made and seconded. Yes. Made and seconded for a positive recommendation. We yeah, consider uh, yours withdrawn. Mine's gone. Okay. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. okay. Can, I, can I just make a general comment? Yes. Sure. Yeah, I, 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 I think it's, I, I, I try and we're not always successful at contacting either the staff to a committee or commission or chair that I do find it really helpful to get you know, comments and I know we talked about trying to incorporate that a little bit more officially into our process and it's kind of ad hoc which is fine but I do think it's very helpful when we get an opinion from a committee chair. Thank you. Okay, housing partnership. We have Richard Aguso. 245 Chestnut Street, Florence, from July 2016 through June 2019 with a, a reappointment. Allison Ron, 19 Market Street, Appointment B, Northampton, term September 2016 through June 2019. Then Consulate Bigelow, you were assigned those two. Thank you. Yes, I, I had a chance to talk with them both as well as with Peg Keller, who's, who staffs the housing partnership. and. Uh, Peg is really pleased with kind of the evolving membership of the partnership uh, uh, and these two sort of represent that. Richard is definitely the institutional memory of housing partnership. I talked to him this morning, it goes back, he says that makes 30 years even before there was a housing partnership. Um, and he's delighted to continue so long as the community wants him to serve and I think the community does. Um, and Allison is an example of the new blood that um, folks are hoping for in that, in that committee. She's um, a full-time community organizer and advocate for homeless and underhoused folks with the, with the Cathedral and the Night, which is housed in the First Churches. And uh, she would indeed bring uh, youthful energy and her day-to-day first-hand experience uh, working with on the streets, so um, I would uh, definitely recommend that uh, both of those um, 
recommendations go forward with a positive recommendation. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, Human Rights Commission, which was Councilor Carney, who was to um, do a follow up on that, and I've asked Pam to do that for us to read it off. Karen Bellavance Grants, 19 Church Street, North Amherst, term September 2016 through June 2019. Davina Miller, 33 Summer Street, North Amherst, term September 2016 through June 2019. Thank so, you. Yep. So, Councilor Carney indicates she unequivocally recommends the appointments of Karen Bellavance Grace and Davina Miller to the Human Rights Commission. Both women are known quantities of outstanding city service. Ms. Bell Vance Grace serving for many years as the mayoral aide and Ms. Miller as school committee member from Ward 1. Each will also bring unique perspectives to the commission. Ms. Bell Vance Grace's dedication to social justice movements and work for the Unitarian Universalists and Ms. Miller's experience as a psychologist and a clinician. talk about both of those applicants. I have to agree what Councilor Carney is saying. They have done a tremendous city services to this city, and I think they would both make good candidates for human um, commission. Is that your motion? I'll second Okay, public shade tree. Councilor LaBarge. Um, top Ford, 78 Fern Street, Florence, term July 2016 through June 2019, which is a reappointment. And um, Todd was really excellent. Him and I were going back and forth on emails. He wants to thank us for the opportunity to discuss the Public Shade Tree Commission. Since my original appointment on the newly chartered Public Shade Tree Commission last year. We have accomplished much and I look forward to continuing the pace during my next term. I currently serve as Vice Chair of the Public Shade Tree Commission. I also represent the Public Shade Tree Commission on the Bicycle and Pedestrian Subcommittee of Transportation Committee. My primary areas of focus on the Public Shade Tree Commission are trees as a critical element of the urban design framework, regulatory consistency and coordination to ensure overall protection of public shade trees across multiple permitting platforms, creation of a new public shade tree protection ordinance to codify enhanced shade tree protections and the process by which shade trees may be removed for public health and safety enhance public shade tree awareness, particularly in urban centers, such as downtown Northampton, and working collaboratively to create cross-department coordination regarding inventories, plans, designs, and other city initiatives that impact the future of our urban forests. Our accomplished to date include planting hundreds of shade trees, setting up volunteer structure, setting framework for comprehensive regulation slash ordinance review as they pertain to public shade trees. Working with planning in the Department of Public Works to ensure that trees are an integral part of street design. Winning a grant for a public shade tree inventory, which will set the stage for our next round of work. I am proud of what we have accomplished in so short a time and I look forward to continuing our work. So just reading and going back and forth with Tom, with Todd, you can tell, you know, he has such vibrance for the city and being on this committee, I would highly recommend him. I would move a positive recommendation. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, this is another long one. Maryland. Castriata, I think that's how you say it. 79 West Street, Northampton, term July 2016 through June 2019, and another reappointment. <coughs> <coughs> 
she was on vacation and we finally were able to do by email going back and forth. And she is saying, dear city councilors of Northampton, it was with great pleasure that I share with you why I'm reapplying for Northampton's Public Shade Tree Commission. I have delighted in serving on this seven member commission since its inauguration last year, actively participating in the creation of long range management plan for our urban forest. Some of my contributions include co-crafting, analyzing, analyzing the 10 questions public survey issued to North Anton Citizen last fall, organizing this spring's Arbor Day events with tree planting by students at each of the city's elementary schools, and acting as a liaison to newly formed volunteer group. My group, Facilitation Envisioning Skills have, I feel, been beneficial to the commission and maintaining an effective and cooperative group process. I have a great passion for the conservation and promotion of public shade trees because I understand their multifacet value. Improved air quality and beauty, cooling streets and sidewalks for pedestrian and drivers. Reduce home cooling and heating costs. Increased property value and economic vibrancy habitat and food for wildlife, as well as stormwater mitigation and other climate related benefits. In addition to 15 years of relevant work experience as an environmental professional, I earned a master's degree in conservation biology in 2014. A few positions I have held that demonstrate my competency include organic land care program coordinator, for NOFA, Massachusetts Park Interpreter and Regional Interpretive Coordinator for the Massachusetts Department of Conservation and Recreation. Conservation easement steward for the Harris Center for Conservation Education and Project Manager for the Center for Climate Preparedness and Community Resilience at Anta University, New England. Volunteer community service is very important to me. A few examples of my board and committee experience, including serving a three-year term on the governing board of Arlington Street Church Unitarian Universalist, serving as one of 100 delegates on a Cambridge Climate Emergency Congress convened by the mayor of Cambridge, and serving as the student representative on the President's Council at AUNE. I feel that developing and demonstrating leadership skills is an important part of our individual and collective response to a world in crisis. During my three-year graduate school program, I was trained and mentored by Tom Wessels, author of Reading and Forested Landscape, in addition to receiving the Ginsburg Wessels Fellowship for Academic Excellence and True Leadership awarded to one student each year by the Environmental Studies faculty. I also received the President's Distinguished Leadership Award, awarded to one student at AUE 2014 commencement. As a North Dartmouth resident, I continue to eagerly offer my professional expertise, community spirit, and leadership skills to this city's development of a verdant and vibrant tree canopy. Kindly, Marion Castrati. I think she's really showing her, you know, um, go that she wants to do what she wants to do in our city and work and make it vibrant. And she has all the knowledge. And I highly recommend that we reappoint her. Oh, So that takes care of the seven applicants that were referred to us on September 1st. Now we have four applicants coming that were referred to our committee on September 15th. And I have Joseph Pease. Positive recommendation for all of them 
and then we'll go through and comment on each individual. You want to make a positive recommendation for all of them right now? I don't know. Just one way to do it, and then sure. you can always remove people from yeah. that motion. Yeah. It means that the default, technically, is that we would approve unless information doesn't come to So I would, I would second that. Okay. Oh, so as a group, okay. remaining. Okay. What can I make a recommendation? Oh, I, I move a positive recommendation for the remaining um, four applicants. For the four that we're going to be talking about? Mm -hmm. And then during the discussion, perhaps so we can comment. Dennis, second that. So it's, oh, you just want to well, it's on, so, 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 it. so it's on the floor, and now we can yeah, now, quick quick discussion. Discussion. now we can just discuss each okay. individual. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so it was referred to me for Joseph. Um, lives at 685 Iron Road, Florence, term October 2016 through June 2019. I received an email from Joseph, and we also talked on the phone. He did state, if you read his resume, that he is a sculptor and a musician. He owns his own business, making custom props for corporate events and doing sculptural services. Joseph and his family moved to North Dayton five years ago, and he knew no one here. In an effort to familiarize himself with the community, he volunteered to help at different art council events, like the Gong Show, where he helped make sets, and trans performance, where he was a help backstage. Steve Sanderson had mentioned that they could use more in-depth help, and so Joseph decided to apply to the Arts Council to help in any way he can. Joseph stated that having the skill set I do an experience he has, he thinks he can add something to this committee. Okay. Perhaps we make a motion. Well, it's in the main motion. Yep. So, should we discuss Mr. Nolan? Sure. Okay. And that's. I, I, I had a chance to speak with Denny Nolan last week. He's a long time realtor, he's had his real estate business in Northampton since 1986. He's very familiar with the work of the assessor's office and now there were the years he was recruited or asked to consider this by, by Joanne Serafin. Uh, and uh, there's no reason to not support him being appointed to the Board of Assessors. And um, if we can make a comment on Ms. Welsh. Yes. Um, Margaret Welsh is someone that I had known. Um, can see she's a self-employed attorney. Um, I also see no reason not to appoint her to the board of a, um, assessors. I think she was actually, my conversation with the mayor, eager to do the job. Mm -hmm. If you can get, you know, passionate about the board of assessors, that counts for a lot. I think, so. I think she'd be qualified to do the job. The only thing I would I would note is 143 Main Street in Northampton is her business address. And I, I told the mayor about my concern that, to my knowledge, Margaret Welsh lived in East Hampton. Um, That's what I thought too. Okay, oh. I mean, I think she's from the city. Anyway, the mayor. She did live on my ward with her. Park Hill Road, I think, or no, something. No, she like lived that. on Great on off where Patty Healy lives. Okay, her parents up there. Didn't. She left, lived with her mother, and then her mother passed, and she moved out. Mm -hmm. They put the house up for sale, and I think you're right. I think it's an East Ham. Well, and but after speaking to the mayor, who this is new information to him, and he investigated it, uh, I'll just read the response from the mayor. Uh, he said, I'm writing with an update following a recent conversation with the pending appointment of Margaret Welsh, the Board of Assessors. Attorney Welsh is now leasing a home at 349 Coles Meadow Road in Northampton. Mm -hmm. I've just confirmed with the city clerk that she is registered to vote in Northampton. Mm -hmm. um, uh, you know, I guess I will leave it there. Um, basically, yeah. I want, for the purpose of the record, mm -hmm. to state that we're clear she was in Northampton. And just as a point of information, um, a, a, a rookie question. Uh, uh, for, for any uh, appointments, uh, operating a business in Northampton but living elsewhere would not be sufficient for appointments. Is that what I take? My, my understanding, I would have to double check, but I think the mayor's administrative code, the um, or order setting up the administrative code, does specify that. Okay. I think they do. So I gather. Just see the residents, yeah. Okay. Okay. okay, planning board, um, Maureen Carney was going to talk about that, so I asked Pam Powers to talk about 
Sugar could use Dio Libria. Councilor uh, Carney indicates she also recommends the appointment of Mr. De Oliveria as associate member to the planning board. His resume shows him to be immensely qualified in the areas of urban study and regional planning. In our conversation, Mr. De Oliveria noted the global perspective he brings to his work, which also includes lecture positions at UMass Amherst. He is experienced in sustainability projects in the Los Angeles region and has worked internationally in San Paolo, Brazil, and El Salvador. I, I would, I see no reason to not approve him as well, which is kind of part of the motion on the floor. So, all right, so I move the question. Take a vote on the floor. We have a motion on the floor. Okay. Aye. Aye. Okay. Okay. Excellent. Oh, Would you like to make the motion to adjourn? <laughs> well, so the record can show. So, so moved. Have you been waiting outside? <laughs> She's been watching because I'm like a window. <laughs> Anyways, um, did you have, was it Adam Novick that came? Yes. Oh, good. Okay. And we literally just so he did finished with our recommendations. All right. City Council on you. I believe we did. Yeah, we voted that one, right? unanimously yep. for those four. Okay. Any new business? No. I have old business. Oh, okay. Sorry. Um, um, Meredith O'Leary couldn't come today. Oh, I was curious about that. So I was wondering if you, if it was still an issue that you wanted to have her come? Well, that's when we had somebody else here. That, that was the building inspector. Yes. Yes. So. And she was on vacation then too. Right. Right. Yep. So I, I no. didn't know if it's something that you still wanted to follow through on? Or? No, because it has something where she was working with the building department also. Okay. All right. Yep. So Thank we'll, you. we'll skip that. Thank you. Move to adjourn. Move to adjourn. So we're second. Second. Hi. 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 <laughs>